And yet many of our Pentecostal brothers and sisters would say, if you really <laughs> got saved, you would oh, be yeah. delivered. This conversation between Lecrae and a same-sex attracted Christian will give you a lot to think about. Let's jump into the video. In the LGBTQI plus community and the Woolwood Fool. That's so, powerful. Yeah. So I in many of the conservative Christian worlds, probably the intellectual groups, the Anglicans and so on and so forth, they probably wouldn't have a problem with you articulating something yeah. along the lines of, well, yes, I met Jesus and mm -hmm. I am same-sex attracted or mm -hmm. gay, right? Mm -hmm. But you are acknowledging gifts of the spirit. Mm -hmm. You're acknowledging many of the Pentecostal world's um, affirmate, affirming kind of yeah. moments. And yet many of our Pentecostal brothers and sisters would say, if you really <laughs> got saved, you would oh, be yeah. delivered from being gay. This is similar to what Marcus Rogers was saying in regards to Jackie Hill Perry experiencing same-sex attraction. Now, to be clear, Marcus did not question Jackie's salvation. He reiterated over and over again that he does think that she is saved. While I do think that this presents a bit of a problem pertaining to your identity and the gifts, keep in mind that Paul tells us in Romans eleven twenty nine 29, that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The context here is talking about the people of Israel, but I do think that the principle applies. Unfortunately, we've also seen or heard of scenarios where a pastor or a leader is doing great things for the kingdom of God, and it really looks like God is blessing their ministry. Only then to find out that this particular individual was living in secret sin. All that to say that evidence of the gifts or blessing of those gifts don't necessarily mean God's approval. David Guzik recently said that this could be God extending his mercy so that you would repent. There's a difference between legitimate charismatic spirituality in the scriptures mm. and what I call the Corinthian syndrome. Okay. So, the church that was the hardest for Paul to pastor was the Corinthian church. It was a mess. Mm. And I think that the Pentecostal charismatic church can be a lot more like the Corinthian church than actually the church that Jesus wants. Oof. And has pridefully misused the gifts Oof. and turned people off them. And I think that the fundamental problem is if you do not practice the gifts with the humility of Jesus Christ undergirding it, mm. it's lost. That's good. So, you know, that's where I am 100% in, bring on the spiritual gifts. I love, my whole life is littered yeah. with tongues, with prophecy, with Visions, arms dreams. giving, with administration, with, mm. you know, service, with mercy, with everything, the whole gamut. Yeah. Because that's Jesus, you yeah. know, he is given those gifts, but we misuse them because of our flesh. And I think a lot of Pentecostals and Charismatics have been fleshly mm. because we haven't lived the cross. Mm. We haven't let our flesh be crucified. And so then we've produced cessationists, Yeah, you know? And so yeah. what does it look like to counteract that problem, mm. to be a humble Charismatic? These are some strong takes. While I understand why he is saying this, I would like to point out that in spite of all of this, the Corinthian church was practicing the gifts. And while they definitely at times misused them, Paul does applaud them for using the gifts, especially prophecy. When we talk about the Pentecostal church, something that I think gets overlooked is the difference between oneness and Trinitarian Pentecostals. I think that's a very important distinction. As far as the Pentecostal charismatic church, there is a propensity to abuse the gifts or to make people feel less than because they are unable to speak in tongues or they haven't been baptized by the Spirit. So that, that is a legitimate problem. That just isn't biblical, right? Paul tells us in Corinthians that we don't all receive the same gifts, yet they all come from the one Spirit. It's easy and it's sometimes popular to dunk all over Pentecostals and Charismatics for the things that are doing wrong. But we often ignore the fact that they are the ones praying for healing and they are the ones who are actively practicing deliverance. While both of those can be abused, for the most part, they are the only ones employing these gifts. They are the only ones doing 
this particular calling. That's a, that's a lot in and of itself. I'm curious, that's where you are today. Oh, yeah. But when you first convert, are you feeling like you need to be delivered from your homosexual tendencies? Are you feeling like, what, like what was your vantage point in you know, your perspective? Jesus said to me just, I think for the first three years, I was actually, a f what people say is affirming. I don't like that word because yeah. I'm affirming. Right. It's not affirming of certain choices outside of the created order of God. Okay. <laughs> okay. But you know what I mean? Like I, I was what was called side A in the gay Christian world. So talk about side A, side B. What are, what is side A? So side, side B? A, side B. So when I entered the gay Christian world, it was it was it was a, it was a ride. It was mm -hmm. a roller coaster ride. But I didn't want to reinvent the language. You know, there's never ideal language for anything. Yeah. And people who pick at the language are just homophobic. They don't oh. want to do the work. Oh. That's an L take. I, what about the people like Rachel Gilson and Greg Coles? They disagree about the terminology, but to say that they're not doing the work. It's just dishonest. Man, to be fair, maybe he just doesn't know them. So I don't want to you know, point the fingers too strongly here. Another example, Robert Gagnon. He is more conservative on this particular issue. He has written an extensive book on this topic. And he takes issue with this terminology, with this language. But to say that they're not doing the work, like, come on, man. We can disagree, but I, let's be honest in our disagreement. Yeah. Like. If I enter into someone else's conversation, I'm like, I don't want to learn your language yeah. because you're all sinners. It's like, look, there's problems there. Yeah. <laughs> and so I get it. It's a lot. But it's like you learn a language to love someone. That's right. I think this is a good take. But where do we draw the line? The guardrails are there for a reason. It's not wise to just ignore them. What do you mean by loving someone by learning their language? Because some people would say if you disagree with them, then you don't love them. So to make such a blanket statement, I don't think it's helpful. To be fair, this happens on both sides. So this isn't, this isn't just me you know, picking on him or picking at this particular side of the conversation. It's a both sides thing. Side A, side B. Side A, the belief that gay marriage is, is compatible with the will of God. Mm -hmm. Side B would be that gay marriage is not compatible with the will of God. Right. Side A and side B share some similarity in that we are identify in some way as either same-sex attracted or gay. Mm -hmm. Not everyone inside B will identify as gay. Some will prefer same-sex attracted. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't see saying that I'm gay as a sin. They right. would see it as, you know, a permissible thing, but not how I am called to, to identify. Just so we're clear, I don't see a way for someone to be a Christian and believe that same-sex marriage is compatible with the will of God. Either we're following what God commands in scripture or we're not. And if you reject the scripture, then you disagree with Jesus. I understand, you know, the whole mindset of the different sides, but this is more to do with progressive Christianity than biblical Christianity. And it's important that we make that distinction and not try to conflate the two. That's not helpful. So there's space to move inside B. It's not just identify gay as gay or else. Yeah. But I think what's really beautiful about these two groups is like, we don't agree. It's irreconcilable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like either gay marriage is fine before God or it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's this beautiful solidarity, even though we disagree. And where does that come from? Well, I think it's the fact that sexuality is not just an ethical question. Mm. It's a question about the mystery of evil and suffering. Why would God let there be a population of people who have a desire that is not changing and that mm -hmm. he doesn't necessarily change, mm -hmm. that is misaligned with his created order, mm -hmm. not change it, mm -hmm. and then if they do anything in the direction of acting on it, it's sin. Mm. That's a problem. Mm. But you know what? I think Jesus meets that problem. And I remember once reading Isaiah 56 which is all about the future, the new covenant, like when the Gentiles will come in and everyone will be saved. And it says to the eunuchs who obey my commands and live according to my Sabbaths, within my house and its walls, I will give a name better than sons and daughters. Just park there, better than sons and daughters. What Ooh. does that mean? Better than being straight. Mm. Oh, what? You say, oh, okay. <laughs> better than sons and daughters, an eternal name, 
an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Mm. That is amazing. So God says like, where you lack because of the fall, mm -hmm. not because necessarily of your own choice. Right. If you come and live my way yeah. and give that to me, I will give you a name better than sons and daughters, mm. better than the very thing that you're excluded from. And so I live as a gay celibate Christian now, and I went through a long journey to get here. Yeah. Uh, in that name. Yeah. Of receiving a name better than the thing I lack. I'm only excluded from one created good. I don't take issue with saying that sexuality is not just an ethical question. It's more than that. But I would say the ethical piece is a big part of it. Throughout scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we repeatedly see an emphasis on sexual immorality. I do think this is a good question. Why wouldn't God change it? But then again, you can make the same case for all other sins. I would just like to remind people that there are instances where people's desires do change, right? When we're talking about this particular lifestyle, we've seen instances where people's desires do change. I wholeheartedly agree with the statement that Jesus meets the problem. Jesus is the solution for all sins. I do think we should be careful with this idea that what we lack is not just it's not because of our own choice. Yes, the fall plays a, a big role in this, right? Probably maybe the biggest role to an extent, but that doesn't mean that we are not responsible for the choices that we make, right? That we're not res responsible for the actions that, that we do. So I, I just want to make sure that we're not trying to shift blame here, right? That's not helpful in the short run or long term. Personally, I find it mind boggling that more churches have not been willing to take a clear stance on this issue, like included in your statement of belief. Why not come out and say that same sex marriage is not compatible with the scripture or better yet, since one of the accusations is that the church is singling out one particular sin, which historically is true. Why not come out and say, we affirm the biblical stance that sex is to be between one man and one woman within the covenant of marriage. In that one brief statement, you address fornication, polygamy, and same-sex marriage. To wrap things up here, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, like the NIV here. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's continue to pursue good and bring glory to the name of Jesus. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time.